Hello everyone, today we will be covering um, type 2 diabetes, so in terms of diagnosis, management and complications, and I'd like to welcome back our guest lecturer for today, Felicity from IMU, so you might remember her from the last lecture, okay? So the structure of today will be about the same as last, we'll go through four cases, and then we've made a bunch of questions at the end for you to try for yourself. Alright, so let's start with the story. Okay, so um, this is our case. Uh, once upon a time in the land far away, Mr. Drump and Mr. Bonson were sharing a cosy Airbnb room in a remote village in Cornwall. Uh, COVID-19 had left them pretty penniless, which meant they had to share a single bed. The next morning, Mr. Drump has a long sour face as he was unable to catch a wink of sleep. He was constantly woken up by Mr. Bonson, who had to go to the toilet six times in one night. So being a concerned partner, Mr. Drum advised Mr. Bonson to see the GP. Right. So at the GP, what happened was um, Mr. Bonson revealed that he had been having such symptoms for over three months now. He also adds that he has been feeling increasingly thirsty over the last few weeks. Um, but he attributes this to having to deal with his salty colleagues over Brexit. He has a strong family history of cardiovascular diseases chronic smoker of 30 pack years, consumes alcohol almost every day and also smokes marijuana to distress. His only form of exercise is walking from home to work where he makes his daily live stream update to his 15 YouTube subscribers. Alrighty, so this is what happened at the GP. You took his vital signs. Um, it's only significant for uh, high BP and borderline a high BP about 141 over 90 millimeters mercury. General physical examination, you find out that his BMI is high. He's also got a, um, a waist circumference of 115 centimeters. Examination of organ systems, cardiovascular, heart sound 1, 2 was heard, uh, no murmurs, respiratory clear, abdominal soft, non tender. Okay. Oh, and we also did a 10 gram monofilament and it was reactive. Okay, so um, this was the plan that we had outlined um, for Mr. Bonson at this point. So firstly, you obtain a capillary blood glucose because we're obviously suspecting diabetes here. Um, we would also order an ECG and a chest x-ray um, just for screening purposes. Uh, obtain other bloods as well, uh, full blood count, lipid profile, renal profile, lymph function test, HbA1c. Um, most of them are for um, like a baseline record. Um, we're also going to do a urine dipstick to look for evidence of microalbuminuria and uh, we also like to order a fundoscopy. Okay, so these are his results. His FBCs came back normal. His um, urea and his uh, electrolytes um, showed significance uh, for an elevated urea creatinine and his GFR is at 75. Um, liver function test was normal. Lipid profile was also significant. It's got uh, triglycerides, which are off the roof, about 2.3 millimoles. HDLs are low, 0 0.8, and LDL about 2.8. So we did the random capillary blood glucose. It showed like um, it showed 11.8 millimoles, and his HbA1c is at 48 millimoles. Okay. So um, at this point, what is your diagnosis? Go ahead and pause um, the recording and uh, try to gather your thoughts. Okay, so here we've diagnosed him with uh, metabolic syndrome, uh, number one, because, um, well, he's quite certain he's got diabetes. He's got um, deranged liver, uh, lipid profile values as well. Um, then he's also got obesity, so uh, we add them all together. He's got metabolic syndrome. Oh, and I forgot, he's also got hypertension, yeah? Okay, so this is uh, uh, something else, another quiz. So what will you do now? So you can just pause here if you like, but at this point we would like to advise him on lifestyle changes first before we actually start him on medication. Um, just to want to add one thing in case of for those of you wondering why don't just start him on metformin straight away. So I actually spoke to my GP whom I did my year 5 placement with and in general the GP said that they would like to try lifestyle changes first for everyone with um, elevated blood glucose levels before they start metformin. Um, and in terms of cutoff, so you will look for an HbA1c of I believe 7.5% and that's when you would consider starting metformin straight away. Um, 
But if even if they have an HBN A1C of 7.5%, um, and if they're determined to make lifestyle changes and you're able to identify the possible cause, so maybe if they're eating like uh, 10, 10 sticks of ice cream every day and if they're willing to change that, then you would still advise you on lifestyle changes first. So try lifestyle for three months. If that doesn't work, then start on metformin. So that's the general um, pathway you would follow. Perfect. Thank you, Abram. Okay, so... Um this table is very important because uh, it will help us to diagnose um, diabetes, uh, impact glucose tolerance, as well as impact fasting glucose. So if you were just to go down the table um, with your index patient, you'll be able to hopefully pick up the diagnosis. So in this case, um, in this case with Mr. Bonson, we'll look at the um, the diabetic values. So it's got fasting plasma glucose is more than 7.0. Um, two hour plasma glucose is more than 11.1. Resting, sorry, random plasma glucose, also more than 11.1, and HbA1c levels of more than 48. So he would qualify um, uh, to be diagnosed as a diabetic. Okay. All right, so um, the diagnosis of um, type 2 diabetes can be made either by a plasma glucose or a HbA1c sample, but usually we take both. Um, so usually we'll start off with a plasma glucose sample. Again, fasting will be more than 7, random will be more than 11.1. And um, this is an important point to make because um, if a patient is symptomatic, for example, he's complaining of pins and needles on his, um, on his foot or if he's got um, polyuria, polydipsia, we only need one positive plasma glucose test to confirm the diagnosis. So, But if the patient is asymptomatic and he is at risk for developing type 2 diabetes, then we will require two positive plasma um, glucose tests and uh, preferably taken on separate occasions. Um, so that's one very important point. And then we'll go on to obtaining the HbA1c levels. And if they are more than 48 millimoles, then it is diagnostic of diabetes. Okay. So the um, story continues. Four weeks later, Mr. Bonson actually comes back to the GP and his blood sugar is still through the roof. He has been compliant to his medications, but unfortunately he hasn't been following any of your lifestyle advice. He held a strong belief that he should not be compromising on his lifestyle choices, especially when the NHS is free. Um, so the GP decided it would be best to step up his uh, diabetic medications. Okay, so if you were to look at this um, algorithm here, it's uh, taken from uh, NICE 2015. Um, if we, this, this is where Mr. Bonson is at the moment. I, I think you can see my mouse. Um, so his HbA1c levels are still above 48 millimoles. So we have to start him on metformin. And we want to aim for a HbA1c level of less than 53 millimoles. Um, so that's that's generally the plan here. But if we do not achieve this target value, we would go down the algorithm and you can see first intensification and second intensification. So we'll go through all of these drugs in the next few slides. Okay. So um, the next few slides can look a bit daunting, but I uh, just need you to remember five oral antidiabetics and two, um, uh, two injectables um, for uh, diabetes. So the five include metformin, sulfonylureas, TZDs, then we've got the DPP-4s and SLGTs. I'm not going to go through the entire table here, but I uh, just want to pick up on some important points. The most common oral anti-diabetic um, we use for patients with diabetes um, are your metformins. Um, what's important about metformin is that um, it's contraindicated in patients with chronic kidney disease uh, stage 4 um, because they can cause lactic acidosis. So that's something to pay close attention to. Okay, so next would be the sulfonylureas. Sulfonylureas, they are notoriously known for causing hypoglycemia and weight gain. Um, and they are... They also have an adverse effect on beta cells of your pancreas for prolonged periods, when, when used in prolonged periods. So I also want to take care with these medications, especially the longer acting ones. Okay. Uh, next one on the list is TZDs, um, notoriously known um, for causing weight gain as well, as well as fluid retention. So you just want to be careful in um, heart failure. 
Right. DPP4 inhibitors, also known as your gliptins, um, they're generally very well-behaved drugs. Um, so they can be, you, know, you don't have to take so much caution with this one. Okay, and your SGLT2, um, they are known to cause flatulence and diarrhea, and it results in weight loss. Okay. Right, then we've got two subcutaneous anti-diabetics. So you've got a GLP-1 agonist and your insulin. Um, this GLP-1 agonist, um, a lot of good things about it, particularly on how it results in weight loss and your insulin. Um, of course, you know, when all else fails, you want to start a patient on insulin. Just remember that it can cause weight gain, it can cause hypoglycemia, as well as lipodystrophy. Um, so to avoid lipodystrophy, remember to always alternate at um, injection sites. Okay. So uh, I put that in this slide because I thought it was pretty interesting. Um, you know, I, I feel like medical students are quite clueless on how to commence uh, insulin for our diabetic patients. So you just, it's basically only four rules. Uh, you want to start the patient off with a basal insulin. Um, basal means like a long-acting or intermediate-acting um, insulin, uh, preferably taken at night. Um, so once daily dosing at night, and your starting dose is at 0 0.2 units per kg body weight, um, and you may continue metformin. Um, so if the patient is already has already been on metformin, you just keep that on. But if the patient is on metformin as well as sulfonylurea, you remove the sulfonylurea, keep the metformin while you're adjusting your insulin. Um, but of course, um, you will have to titrate your insulin uh, dosage depending on your um, plasma glucose levels and uh, whether you achieve target values or not. Okay. So I uh, just put in this slide because I thought it was pretty interesting. Um, so these are your target values, the one in the red box. Um, so fasting would be 4.4 to 7, postprandial 4.4 to 8.5, and A1C levels is generally less than 6.5%. This one, um, we've got some, some exceptions to this rule, but let's just leave it here at this point. Okay. All right, thank you, Felicity. So just moving on to the last two um, sections of this lecture, they're talking a bit more about hospital presentations with diabetic patients. So it's been six months um, since starting, since GP has first seen Mr. Bonson. He's tried multiple regimens, but Mr. Mr. Bonson's levels were still um, elevated. So therefore, the, the GP decided that it would be best to start insulin, okay? Um, unfortunately, he thought that it would be some kind of miracle drug where um, Anytime he had a drink or had a pint, his levels would, um, he would just take the insulin and that would bring his levels back down. So whenever he ended up injecting himself 12 times a day. Okay. Um, so one evening he was found by his partner on the floor and the ambulance was called. Um, just want to let you know there's a bit of typo in this passage as well. So if you see a Mr. Johnson's meant to be Mr. Bonds and there's just a bit of typo, finger slippage. <laughs> All right, so just very briefly about hypoglycemia. The thing to know about hypoglycemia is that um, everyone's glycemic threshold varies. That means that just because someone is at, for example, a value of 4.5, doesn't mean that he won't have any hypoglycemic symptoms. So just be wary that that level changes from person to person. But in terms of clinically impo clinical importance, the biochemical hypoglycemia value is 3.0. And some of the things you want to look out for, so you start off having autonomic symptoms first that include trembling, palpitation, sweating, anxiety, nausea, and hunger. And then if that's not treated, they still that will progress into neuroglycopenic symptoms, and these are definitely very worrying. You get things like confusion, difficulty concentrating, drowsiness, and difficulty speaking. So you want to treat it before it progresses to neuroglycopenic symptoms. So in terms of treatment for hypoglycemia, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. You give them sugar. And what you give them depends on how severe their hypoglycemia is. So I find this um, point, this slide really useful. So if, if they're mild, so they're able to self-treat, then you just give them something sugary, um, leucosate, normal coke. Well, it's a bit hard to find now in the UK, but try to find anything sugary and in liquid form because those are quite fast acting. You can try giving um, glucose tablets or... Um, sugar in water. So anything they can consume through the mouth and it's quick acting. 
Moderate wise, this is when they are conscious but can't self-administer, so they might be confused or tired and unable to give themselves. So that's when you use glucogel. So you can just rub it into the gums along the cheeks and that will be absorbed buccally or you can consider iron glucagon if you have that as well. But if you don't have glucogel, iron glucagon, again, you can try giving something sugary, um, a sugary drink quickly and see if that helps. And just retest in 15 minutes to see if they still need treatment. And then if they're unconscious, that's when you would give them IV glucose. So I think, um, if I'm not mistaken, the guidelines recommend 75 mils of 20% glucose. Um, you can give 50%, but the thing about 50% is that it's very um, um, corrosive for the veins. It causes extravasation. So just be careful if you decide to give 50%. And then lastly, so he... After the, his scare his hypoglycemic episode, Mr. Bonson, that it would be best for him to stop all of his diabetic medications because he did not want anything like that happening again. And he started feeling really tired, lethargic, but he just shrugged it off because um, work has been really stressful for him lately. And once again, two weeks later, he was found collapsed in the toilet. Okay, so on a &E, being the good doctor you, do, you are, you did A, B, C, D, E, and you found that he is dry. And he is um, he is hypothermic, and his glucose is really really high. Okay, um, so again, this is what we would do in that situation um, as a house officer in A&E. So you would monitor, do a urine dip because that's important to look for ketones because that's one of the differentiating factors. You do his bloods. Since it's so dry, IV fluids straight away, and you will want to monitor his urine output. Um, you also consider um, you also prescribe him some low molecular weight heparin to prevent any um, to prevent any clots from happening. You order an ECG, a chest radiograph, and you also inform your senior. So these are his bloods. You've sent them, and they've come back. You can see that he is slightly acidotic. His lactate is elevated, and his UNEs are really deranged. Um, so the UNEs, UNEs are deranged because, well, if you think of it, he's really dry and that's why everything's really concentrated and you can see his GFR is really low as well. So you can see his pH of his blood is 7.33, so there is still some acidosis, but it, it is quite mild. Um, this is caused by a um, little bit, but very, very minimal keto acids and lactic acid as well from the hypoperfusion of tissues. And his electrolyte levels are so high because of the hyperosmotic state and the osmotic diuresis. Okay, so he's dry, his kidneys are suffering, and he's slightly acidotic. So I think it's pretty obvious here. He is suffering from HHS. So some of the features which make HHS more probable are listed in this um, slide. I won't go through them all, but typically um, it takes about one week or so for it to happen. And the, one of the key things you're looking out for is the osmolality. Um, so you can calculate the serum, serum osmolality using this formula here in slide in point number four. Just note as well, this is a point that we could not find any conclusive evidence for, but there are some, um, there are some websites and some resources which says that it's two times potassium added to two times, two times sodium added to two times of potassium. Whereas some say you can omit the potassium. So we're not exactly sure what you would do. So if you're not sure, you can just use this. They're pretty much about the same because potassium levels aren't very high anyway. And in HHS, the levels are normally above, well above 320. Um, and they are also very dehydrated. Um, all right, so yeah, like I said, acidosis is mild because they are not acidotic from ketones. They're, they have minimal ketones, even no ketones in their blood. So the that would cause mild acidosis. If you see acidotic levels, acidosis levels of below 7.3, then you might start suspecting something else. Okay. So this table just tells you the, um, highlights some of the differences between DKA and, and HHS. So some things, like I said, the pH levels tend to be very acidotic in DKA. That's because of um, the keto acids, the formation of keto acids, and you don't have that in HHS. And look at the serum osmolality level. It's really high in HHS as well. Okay, so in terms of diagnosis, some things you want to highlight are hypovolemia. They have marked 
hyperglycemia. So the glucose levels tend to be way over 30. Um, they have no ketones and their blood, blood is really thick. So they have a hyperosmolality above 320. Um, just to take note as well that lactic acidosis can occur in patients on metformin with significant renal failure. So just, I guess it's important to consider patients' past medical history and to look for any pre-existing um, kidney disease. So principles of management, there are four sort of general ones you would do. You want to replace the fluids and electrolytes. You want to normalize the blood glucose. You want to treat the underlying cause, so because they tend to be have, for example, they have a flu or cold that triggers it, and you want to prevent thrombosis because the blood's really thick. It's really important as well not to treat the serum glucose and sodium too quickly because that will that will risk the patient developing CPM. So management of HHS, HHS, I know this slide is quite a lot, but it is quite simple if you just remember these key points. Firstly, you want to replace their fluid. You do it with sodium chloride 0.9%, and you want to replace 50% within the first 12 hours and the rest in the next 12 hours. Okay, moving on to insulin slash glucose. Unlike DKA, you do not give insulin initially in HHS. Okay, so fluid, just giving them the fluid alone will be enough to drive the glucose and serum levels down. The serum glucose and serum glucose and sodium levels down. So start with the fluids first. You only start insulin um, if their blood glucose is not falling by five millimoles per liters per hour, or they develop ketonemia. That's when you start insulin, and you start at a very very slow rate of 0.05 units per kg per hour. And just a point as well: don't you don't want to bring down their glucose levels too quickly. So for the first 24 hours, even if their blood glucose is about 10 to 15, that's perfectly acceptable. Next, potassium, pretty straightforward. Only give it when they start to pee. And you will monitor the, the potassium levels carefully when you're giving insulin. Because if you remember, potassium drives sugar into your cells. And if you're not sure how much potassium to give, you can refer to this table here. Next, about um, thromboprophylaxis. Um, like I mentioned, you would give tinsparin, deltaparin, noxaparin because um, their blood's really thick and you want to prevent a clot from happening, so you want to prevent DVTs and PEs from happening. And just a last point of monitoring response, you, the best thing to do in this, in a case of HHS is that you want to monitor the trend. So I would advise um, calculating the serum osmolality at the start and then plotting it for about maybe every hour from then on. And you just want to make sure there's a downward trend and you, don't want, to make, you want to make sure that the trend is not going down too quickly. Um, and these are just some numbers. Um, I don't think you would. You need to know the exact numbers for how quickly the levels must fall. Just know that you don't want it to fall too quickly. And again, 10 to 15 millimoles for the first 24 hours. All right, so that's the end of our lecture. Thank you so much for listening. Um, so hope you enjoyed the story and hope you enjoyed the lecture. We've actually created a bunch of questions for you to do on your own time. And you can just scroll through them. We'll be sending you the slides. We'll be sending pals the slides so they can send it to you. And if you want to do it properly, the answers are in the notes section. So do it in PowerPoint form first. Okay, so that's it. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Bye, Bye. guys.